Good morning, everybody. Today is the 6th of September, 2022. We have a special meeting for the EV Tall Flight Test Council. In lieu of our regular meeting, we are doing a webinar. And this webinar is hosted by Vertical Flight Society, and it will be posted for years to come on their website. And so if you cannot uh, attend all of this, or if you know somebody who missed it, Please uh, help us spread the word to tell them to come back and they can review it later. Of course, the advantage of watching it now is you have an opportunity to ask questions either in the chat or uh, possibly later on. Uh, we'll do a um, uh, open the mics and, and do so. Uh, of course, as a typical webinar, everybody starts off with a uh, closed mic. If you want to uh, go hot, uh, that's okay. And we'll just, you know, it's pretty informal how we're going to do things today, but this is a uh, opportunity. And this opportunity came up in the discussions of the EVTOL Flight Test Council because we have in our ranks within the council, we have over 200 people. We have a, a fair number of people that are highly experienced in flight test and highly experienced in certification. But we also have a pretty good number of people and organizations that, that actually know very little about certification and what's involved. In the years past, we've had folks like Dave Weber from the FAA and Dave Sizu from the FAA come talk to us about Certification 101 from the FAA side. And that has uh, worked very well. And what that has led to more recently is people coming to us and saying, what else do I need to know? What, what else is out there, right? Because it, they, there's so much to discuss. Well, our friends at the International Test Pilot School have been very proactive about this whole new world and putting out glasses and so forth. And because they've been proactive, I, I came to Giorgio some time ago in Joe uh, last year, and we said, is this something that ITPS could help show? And, and basically, this is not a class. This is an eye-opening experience for all the kinds of things that an organization should be smart on if you're gonna to go to the FAA. And so what the discussions we're gonna have here, and, and it's all um, ITPS's content, and I'm hoping what you get out of this is an appreciation for what it takes to certify, and maybe you need to go get some additional training for certain things, because this is just the very tip of the iceberg. So, uh, with with that uh, two minute introduction, I think everybody has had a chance to get on board and uh, line up. So at this point, um, I will introduce our our prime speaker. Now, Giorgio Clemente is the president of ITPS. He originally uh, has accepted to to give this presentation, but then he got called away on business. But uh, fortunately, we have Joao. <laughs> it's so hard for me to pronounce your name, Joao. It's perfect. <laughs> and uh, he has been with the council since the beginning and he, he knows exactly what we're all about and the kind of people we have within the council and what the industry looks like. He's perfectly placed to do this. So with uh, no further delay, I'll introduce Joel to take us from here. Your ball, sir. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, so let me there. My, my slides are already presenting. So uh, thank you first for uh, having me here. Uh, um, as all said, actually the the, the first approach uh, from Al to discuss about this today uh, was kind of scary because he came up and he first approached us with the extremely hard to be achieved requirements. Uh, we're going to talk about the requirements today, but it was hard to be achieved requirements, and there are so so many topics to be discussed today. And I was so happy actually that Giorgio accepted to talk because I was kind of uh, released from that burden and tried to uh, meet all the all's requirements. But uh, but in the end, um, uh, Giorgio ap apologized. He uh, had some, some business travels to attend. And then because of this, I'm here. Maybe he's apologizing to select myself to present, but I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, as I all said, I'm here since the beginning. so. The idea today is, again, I will do my best to try to, I may not be able to show compliance to all the all the requirement, our chair requirement, but I will do my best to try to talk as much as we can uh, about things that startups should know about certification of flight tests. We're gonna go through different aspects of flight tests and certification flights. 
So uh, let's then start with uh, our, uh, our presentation. So when we look at this slide, you're gonna see that I went through like the Evito Council, Rosetta Stone. I I took a look at uh, all the the previous uh, meeting reports, and it's incredible how much even for highly experienced flight tests, flight testers, we 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 are talking about terms and concepts that are unknown that bring so much and so many uh, interesting discussions in in and throughout those uh, uh, months of of uh, meetings. Uh, however, I, I think one of the um, most important concerns from our uh, communities and this and our professional communities, and this I'm, I'm including SCTP, SFTE, uh, the Vertical Flight Society itself, uh, it's to be able to spread knowledge actually and covering the broad range of people uh, around not only like highly experienced flight testers that can contribute somehow to find, I would not say solutions, but at least to discuss those uh, um, elements that I presented here, but also to be able to bring in newcomers, new testers, and talk about flight test basics in parallel to those, uh, I would say, advanced concepts. So my and probably my uh, objective here today is to be able to uh, talk as much as I can to those newcomers, uh, to those new testers that are, are uh, around, those new companies that are arriving at this brave new world, and talk a little bit more about flight tests and bring them up to speed to be able to reach out also those high-level conversations. And maybe also this presentation today serves as a motivation to other members here in our council, uh, all members from uh, all these uh, professional communities that I mentioned before, uh, to come and also talk a little bit of flight test basics and other uh, uh, topics as well, to try to put uh, all the, the, the flight tests that are around uh, up to speed and able to uh, meet their objectives in terms of development, in terms of certification, and to all of us to be flying safely uh, all around the world. So this is my uh, uh, objective. And again, I will try to do my best to try to go through throughout this presentation on aspects that are important to be understood regarding certification flight and flight tests, all right? So here is the agenda of this presentation. So uh, again, uh, I would say sometimes sorry to the experienced people that it's uh, attending the, the presentation today. Uh, my presentation will start with very basic concepts uh, of the intro to flight test, uh, followed by like the, an overall understanding of the general uh, process that are applied in flight tests, some kind of documentation and, and documents that are created by flight tests through, throughout that process. And later then I will be able to put this process into a context and talk about certification of flight tests. Uh, and, uh, and, and in this point of the, the presentation, I will try to discuss a little bit of other topics that uh, all ask me to, to bring up as well, uh, like means of compliance, simulation, some of those uh, aspects that are important to be highlighted as well. Then I will try to close her with uh, some final remarks. Um, as all mentioned as well, this is a very uh, like relaxed presentation. So uh, if you want to jump in, uh, send your questions uh, on the chat. And if, if you want to come up and, and, and talk as well, please feel free. Uh, the, the guys will try to open the, the mic and we're going to be able to talk. It's really, it's really a talk and I, I don't want to at all. But it's important as well to, I know I already mentioned that, this is not a presentation from any authority. So I'm not talking about our certification authority and awardance authority. I'm talking about uh, from the perspective of a flight test school. So sometimes I will try to generalize concepts. Sometimes I will try to simplify a little bit. Uh, but again, the idea is to try to bring up uh, everyone up to speed and, and in the end to provide as well reference to all the newcomers to where they can find also information and where they can be trained as well. 
So let's go through the introduction to flight tests. And uh, it's, it's interesting because every time that I'm invited by my neighbors to like a, a, a barbecue, I'm from Brazil, so I love barbecue. And, uh, uh, and I go with my orange fly suit. The first thing that the people, and I see that when I enter in that space, people start just staring at me and they probably think that I'm, I'm closer to Tom Cruise or maybe uh, Dan Squade from the, the right stuff. But actually, uh, one of the first things that I try to, to talk about how I do my, my, my job and what kind of uh, involvement I have in flight tests is to try to get rid of that typical and popular image of flight testers as risk takers and uh, people that are typically leaping into the unknown. So the, and maybe that's the reason why I'm not invited by barbecues anymore, but that the, I usually I try to convince them that our flight test community and the flight test, it is a typically an mundane activity that involves a lot of preparation, a lot of a meticulous plane uh, uh, that requires to fly quite precisely and uh, uh, to understand quite well what we are doing. And this is a reality of flight tests. And this is the, the concept that I'll try to bring up to, uh, throughout the entire presentation as well, to try to get rid of these popular images and try to understand what is really what flight tests is all, all about. So when we look at actually the, 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 the definition, and, and another thing that the, the presentation, as I mentioned before, tries to, to bring is uh, to provide to all those newcomers reference where they can find good uh, uh, information about flight tests. I went through, for example, the Agar 300, the volume uh, 14 is the volume regarding introduction to flight tests. And I went there to try to see what is the definition of flight tests. And when I went there, what is written is, uh, it's pretty straightforward. A flight test is actually testing in flight an aircraft or any I-10 equipment of this aircraft. This is the definition from the uh, uh, Agar 300. And uh, 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 what is really important to, to, to discuss here is flight test. It is very similar to many other scientific uh, 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 endeavors, many other scientific, and, and follows actually most of the time, and this is another concept that I'll try to bring throughout, throughout the presentation, brings a lot of uh, uh, concepts from the conventional, the traditional scientific approach. However, of course, dealing in another way with the, all the hazards that we are exposed to and trying to minimize them as, as low as or reasonable as, as, as possible. What is also important to be highlighted is Flight tests, it is a team, an integrated team endeavor. So it's required. Specialized and trained personnel, uh, specialized sensors, uh, uh, specialized process. So all those things will be also highlighted throughout this presentation. And the one thing that I'm also trying to uh, uh, discuss throughout this presentation is that we might add uh, that considering all the evolutions that we see nowadays in terms of uh, uh, wind tunnel simulation, CFD, uh, test stand, ground test, mathematical modeling, um, why we still need flight tests, right? So uh, especially when we are dealing in situations where the, the we are, the, there are, there are, are, are complex interactions between systems or when we need to expose the system or the man machine combination needs to be exposed to the real world, flight test is still probably uh, 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 the only safe and sometimes the only convincing uh, mean of providing the data and information that we need to uh, 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 achieve the or determine if the, the, the system achieved the performance that was required. When we look at this team endeavor, what we are going to find out is, again, uh, the, 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 although in the following two slides, I will focus on uh, two main roles uh, of the flight test team. Uh, it's really important to never forget this is a multidisciplinary and highly integrated activity that requires a team that is composed by many other specialists uh, on test disciplines, 
uh, own actually or driven by other uh, requirements like flight clearance, instrumentation, uh, maintenance. So in these highly integrated and actually multidisciplinary team, there are actually two roles that I would like to highlight throughout the presentation, but it's again, it, it is just a, a sample of the, 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 the personnel that's involved in flight tests, which is the test pilot and the flight test uh, uh, engineer. So the test pilot in this team is the one that brings the operational experience plus the experience that probably was gained throughout years, years of, of flight tests and exposure to different designs and uh, different aircraft uh, uh, characters. And combining this uh, uh, experience with some sound technical background, be able to effectively communicate uh, his or her findings uh, throughout the flight test. So of course, and, and they love to say that it, it is required to, uh, and above average flying skill to be able to fly precisely and efficiently, However, it is an important element of this uh, 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 test team that I would like to highlight. The other uh, uh, element of the team uh, that I'm a proud uh, a part of is the flight test engineer role. Uh, and although, again, I, I went back and tried to look at SFT and uh, again, the AGAR 300, the definition, and we can see that the term flight test engineer is often applied uh, uh, quite loosely. Um, we, we you, overall, we, we think about the flight test engineer as the person that is responsible to uh, coordinating, conducting, managing uh, all the various activities involved uh, that, the, the, uh, uh, that are required actually to meet the objectives of a particular series of uh, flight tests. So he or she is responsible, uh, and of course, again, in cooperation with uh, all the extended flight test team, test pilots, technical specialists, instrumentation engineers, data processing uh, specialists, um, maintenance uh, technicians and engineers uh, for the definition, planning and analysis, which of course requires some kind of uh, a high level of technical skill. Uh, plus also uh, as a flight test engineer is typically involved in the execution of flight tests as well, requires some kind of understanding of the aircraft operation, uh, to be sometimes comfort airborne as well. Uh, and uh, once again, it's typically someone that has a good level or good communication skills to be able to again, present concisely and impartially the results that were obtained. Uh, those skills that I mentioned for test pilots and flight test engineers, uh, they require training. So this is one of the important aspects. I'm, I'm working with the flight test training for uh, uh, more than eight years now, and, and it's one aspect that I would like to highlight throughout the entire presentation. Those skills, they need to be trained. So we need to nurture those skills. So flight test training includes have technical uh, 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 aspects of our space engineering, plus some uh, knowledge about management of, especially due to the involvement in flight test projects. Uh, it requires also exposure to practical applications of the theory of flight. Uh, typically, student test pilots and student test engineers, they are also exposed to this teamwork environment when they are preparing their flights, when they are analyzing their flights. So all of these require some kind of training and these are aspects that we're gonna also discuss throughout this uh, presentation. So now that we talk a little bit, uh, I, I just introduced a, a flight test and I talked about the main roles. Let's go through the process and understand a little bit of uh, uh, how flight tests are uh, executed or where it it starts the flight test process. So uh, what I try to highlight in this slide is uh, all the similarities between the process that are applying flight tests, which we can see in the right-hand side of the presentation, uh, with the traditional scientific method. Okay? Uh, the scientific method, it is a systematic process uh, that is used to investigate any uh, uh, phenomenon that would require or uh, in, in which we would need to acquire some kind of scientific knowledge. Okay. The example 
uh, of the process that I show in the right hand side, please. Uh, it's not meant and it was not placed on this presentation uh, to be used as a good example. It's just a template uh, uh, for which I can discuss important elements, important process, uh, uh, gates, output, and also important documents that are generated throughout the process. Uh, but what, seem, what I try to highlight here, it's similar to the setup of an experiment uh, uh, of any scientific endeavor, we see that flight tests must start with a carefully designed and planned to be able to safely and to uh, be able to collect all the desired data. So this is in the scientific process of what we call as the phase of formulation and application of theory uh, plus the phase in which we are applying that theory to obtain prediction. So this is an important part of the, the process. Uh, although we're going to talk in the following slides about test planning, uh, the, 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 the test planning itself or the, the readiness or how good the test planning was in terms of technical and safety approach, uh, they usually are also associated to kind of collective agreements, what we call the technical review boards and uh, safety review boards or uh, 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 readiness, a uh, flight readiness review board in order to uh, have a peer review and maybe an authority review and approval or if the, 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 the sufficient data will be gathered and if all the actions that were necessary uh, to be taken to minimize all the risks were uh, taken. Uh, the actual flight test that follows that planning phase uh, also follows its own process of pre-preparation uh, uh, of test cards, uh, pre-flight briefings, test conducting, and post-flight briefings. And this is also comprised by the phase that I mentioned here on the scientific method of the execution of the experiment itself, the flight test execution. Once the test is completed, uh, we will see that the data was collected, uh, we will analyze that data, and we will try to draw our conclusions based on the data that was obtained or maybe demonstrate compliance and closing the cycle of the scientific approach. So this is the, the, the way that, that I try to create the correlation between the, science, the classical scientific method and flight tests. And so in the following slides, what I will try to do is I will talk a, a little bit more about important documents that are generated throughout that uh, 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 process that I mentioned here. So the first, and, uh, and again, the, 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 the beginning of the process, uh, of course, um, different uh, test uh, organizations will have different process to trigger our, our test flight and flight test orders typically uh, is the, the, how the flight test schools uh, operate. Typically, there will be some kind of uh, uh, request, flight test requests from other uh, uh, departments. But regardless, the, the, the beginning of the process, it is your planning phase in which the test plan, it is this, uh, or the, the, the plan itself that we we execute here is it, it is a, a systematic a, a structured approach to effective efficient and safe conduct of the test program so in this uh, light what we uh, the way that we see the flight test plan it is a document in which we clearly and concisely describe test objectives and uh, and of, of course the, uh, the the risk uh, involved as well uh, the test plan also provides some uh, means uh, by which the, the, we can uh, make sure that the, the, all the adequate preparation has been uh, foreseen uh, to verify that the, all the, the documents that ensure that the, all the necessary preparations have been completed. And also, especially when we are thinking about certification approach, to also uh, uh, declare that the aircraft is uh, working for flight tests and all design substantiation, all functional uh, test procedures, all ground tests or pre-tests that were required, calibrations, weight and balance, conformity checks, having all uh, successfully completed. Uh, although uh, I, I, I don't like to 
talk um, most about like uh, templates and, and reference, but I left here and, and I um, probably, I hope that the, the handout will have the links working. I left here as well, links to uh, the asset documents, guidance and templates, which contains a flight test plan uh, as an example. And also if you dig in on the FAA, electronic reading room, you're gonna see that there are some two or three examples of uh, test plans uh, also, again, with the overall idea that this presentation may also provide some additional reference and examples uh, for the newcomers uh, around there. And throughout this process, what we will see as well is uh, when we are talking about or having the ability to, or making sure that we are able and capable to gather the uh, necessary data to to be demonstrated. One important part of this process is the definition of the FTI, which I left here in yellow, which, in, which is now our uh, uh, next top that we're gonna discuss. Uh, as I mentioned before, the test plans uh, needs to define all the parameters needed to uh, 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 be uh, recorded and be uh, 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 quantified in order to properly uh, uh, accomplish the tests that were defined. And this is actually uh, uh, done by properly detailing the flight test instrumentation. Of course, there is a great deal of uh, uh, detail and information that is required uh, to prepare and implement inadequate instrumentation specification, so which is not at all the scope of this presentation. Uh, uh, the systems, and, and, and we're going to see nowadays that the system can be uh, run from a very simple system, for example, only using the, as transducers the uh, production aircraft sensors and as a recorder the uh, flight test engineer test card, or maybe we can have very complex systems with hundreds and thousands of uh, 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 transducers and uh, 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 special transducers production uh, representative transducers. And uh, the racks of signal conditioners, uh, multiplexers, uh, modulators, and uh, uh, multiple or very powerful computers that will be converting the data will be uh, also uh, 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 presenting the data in some graphical format. Uh, and even today, when we are talking about, for example, a uh, modern flight test of using of data buses, a uh, digital data bus, we're gonna see that the number of measurements that we have, it's usually even and even bigger than the number of classical uh, flight test measurements. So what I did here was I tried to list few of uh, uh, questions that will provide some general information on elements that make up an instrumentation system and it will provide some guidance. Uh, again, if we're thinking about good reference, especially when we are thinking about like the uh, design uh, of instrumentation, the uh, Agard 160 of like that instrumentation series in all its volumes provides a wealth of information of uh, uh, equally useful uh, 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 parameters or definitions when designing your instrumentation. So questions that I try to uh, highlight here, especially regarding installation, is uh, how intrusive the, the, the installation will be. It's highly dependent on uh, uh, how long the test campaign will be, how much time the, 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 the end of scope of the test, how much time the, the, the flight test vehicle will be available and uh, uh, use it for that purpose. Uh, also, if it is necessary and how the data will be used, if it will be used on board, using data displays, if it will uh, require to be followed on ground by different disciplines as a way to uh, mitigate risks or maybe to, uh, uh, to, to, to be able to gain uh, efficiency in your flight test throughout the land entry. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. The um, the slide is it seems to have gone off presentation mode. We're back at the we're seeing the first slide right now. Oh, that's let me take a look. Well, 
what do you guys see now? Processes and documentation. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I and I was I was yeah. So I was talking about the previous slides. So I was talking about the 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 all additional and special instrumentation that is needed, like video, ballast, uh, exciters for vibration and and flutter, uh, differential GPS as a through source of navigation systems or any other system. So uh, all of those are part of your uh, throughout process or questions that need to be uh, made throughout the, the testing planning phase, of course, based on the scope of your test. Another thing, another uh, uh, important considerations in terms of uh, installation, it is associated to how the system will interact with the flight test vehicle as well, in terms of if it is uh, electrically powered by the vehicle itself or using a battery, if uh, the payload and uh, the, the CG allow you to, uh, in terms of weight, volume, and uh, 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 the definition of location of your FTI, how the system will be designed as well in terms of architecture of the system, if it will be a centralizer or a distributed architecture, if uh, how you're going to scale the, the, the FTI as well in terms of number of channels and the capability to grow uh, uh, the, 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 the size of your FTI uh, throughout the entire process and throughout the entire campaign. Uh, the transducer selection, especially in terms of the range, accuracy, sampling rate that is capable to uh, capture the dynamic that you like to, to, to capture within the range that you like to capture and with the accuracy that is required to demonstrate compliance against what you like to represent, plus all the considerations that need to be done in terms of uh, calibration of those transducers. Uh, my, for some reason, is cycling the, the calibration of those transducers, uh, how those uh, calibrations uh, intervals will impact your flight test campaign, leading time to have the calibrations uh, down, so all the, or the craft down throughout those calibrations. So all those aspects are important to be highlighted as well. Zhao, we have a, a couple of hand raised, hands yes. raised. Would you like to take some questions at this time? Of or? course, yes, yes, let's, let's go for it. Um, so the first question comes in over text. Are there many differences between the FAA and ESA requirements for the flight test plan? Yeah, so when you see the, especially when we compare the, if you go through those two references that I mentioned before, if we go to the uh, document template uh, from EASA and we go for the, the the reading room, which is just providing examples from the FAA. And again, I'm, I'm not talking about, uh, and I'm not representing any of those authorities. You're gonna see that the approach is slightly different. The, the, the flight test plan on the FAA perspective it's much closer to a certification plan uh, in the sense of it's much straightforward in terms of the, the mean of compliance and uh, the, the, the test conditions and definition based on what you, you are trying to demonstrate. The, the EASA is a more uh, in-depth document that contains, that requires uh, a background information, much more information to be provided. And so you see that especially the, the pre-test part of the document is much heavier on the on the EASA template than on the FAA. But again, um, if you are capable to, regardless of what is the template, to achieve those objectives that I mentioned before, to uh, clearly state what is uh, what you are testing, uh, 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 what is required to test, uh, the 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 configuration that you test, and what is being done to in the sense of the test condition, test details, I both of, and this is the, 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 the common element between the two examples is uh, all of them, although in a different way, will go through those uh, basic aspects to overall give to the certification authority the understanding that you are covering everything that's required when you, uh, in, throughout your planning phase uh, to safely and efficiently conduct your tests. Great, thank you. So uh, we have a hand raised from Peter Schmidt. Peter, go ahead. 
sorry, I had put it up to try and uh, note the slide display problem and don't know how to use the interface to put it down. So apologies. Gotcha. Uh, so we have a question from Tony Thompson. Tony, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry, I always just had my hand up for the same reason to get the slides going. Understood. All right, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Joe. All right, thank you. Oh, thank you for the question as well. Uh, so the, the other aspect that is important, especially when we are trying to design and, and define or uh, at least to select hardware and uh, during the FTI design considerations, it is the environmental conditions that this uh, uh, hardware and the FTI will be exposed throughout the flight test campaign because they may be limiting factors uh, in terms of accuracy and performance of your sensors. So I tried to list here some other uh, aspects that uh, are also uh, important to be considered in terms of uh, temperature and uh, of for the envelope that you were trying to, to test and also the temperature or storage and of those uh, vehicles and sensors. Uh, characteristics of vibration and acceleration. So they are especially important to define regions where you're going to install your sensors uh, and different aircraft types and different aircraft locations will be exposed to different levels of vibration and acceleration levels that may increase your signal uh, or reduce your signal noise uh, ratio and also lead you to accuracy problems. Humidity, especially when we are dealing uh, with uh, uh, external installations that also affect the transistor's performance. Uh, if it is, uh, if or if the hardware is capable to, or the equipment was designed to operate in a non-pressurized uh, area and where you install in it. Uh, and of course, um, uh, um, electromagnetic uh, compatibility, it's also a relevant aspect to be considered especially throughout the design phase and uh, when we are thinking about locations and also when we are thinking about the good function once the design is already integrated in your vehicle. So all of those considerations are important to be done. And here I also left a few uh, other reference, uh, especially regarding the environmental conditions. So the DO-160 in the military, uh, specs the MU standard 810, and if we were talking about the MIMC, the MU standard uh, 461. So those are also good reference when we are talking about environmental conditions. Uh, the other aspect that I also highlighted throughout the that is important to be considered in the planning phase it is the uh, risk, uh, and uh, it is self evident that flight testing. Uh, should be conducted and, and actually must be conducted as, as, as safely as possible uh, without hazarding aircraft, without hazarding its crew, uh, the persons and properties on ground. Uh, it's also equally uh, obvious that none uh, of uh, the, the, or most of flight tests will have different uh, degrees of risk and the concept of risk or, or the concept of safety can also be uh, a relative term. So the first thing I try to highlight here and to define it is uh, what is uh, risk. So you can see here in the slide, I also I'm referring a good uh, a, a good uh, 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 reference uh, for risk assessments, which is the MU standard uh, eight uh, eight two. Uh, but here you can see that risk, it is actually a, a, a combination of severity and probability or hazard and exposure. It is actually a measurement or a future impact of a hazard if it is not controlled or, or eliminated. And the hazard, it is, uh, uh, as we can see here in the slide, a real or potential condition that could lead to a mishap. Uh, leading to one effect that uh, you can see here, death, injury, uh, illness, uh, damage, or any other effect. And this is balanced against the uh, probability or the expression of likelihood that this uh, mishap occurred. When we look at the way that flight tests approach actually uh, uh, risk, we are going to see that the, the, 
the flight test process has its own airworthiness and risk management requirements, which most of the times complements the overall safety management uh, system and uh, it's part actually the system, safety, uh, safety management system and complements the overall safety management. Uh, the safety management, it is uh, a continuous and a strategic system that encompasses reporting, investigation, trend analysis, and so on. Uh, and actually flight tests can uh, sometimes add elements to the system. Uh, safety uh, management to uh, especially in situations where there are project or flight test specific risk that should uh, be managed by a specific process and management process uh, uh, to address hazards that are related directly to uh, the flight test activity and specifically to flight tests. In this presentation, although I would love to discuss, but in this presentation, I would not be covering any like advanced system engineering concepts like STPA or STEM, uh, because traditionally what we're going to see is the methodology that is applied to uh, 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 assess the risk in flight tests is mainly based on the hazard assessment and the definition of multiple levels of uh, latent and activity defense. So throughout this, we identify in each test point, in each test condition, in each uh, 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 test plan, the hazard that your test will be associated, uh, listing the, all the potential cause and hazards, assessing the risk in terms of likelihood and, and severity, and identifying all the applicable mitigations and reevaluating if the, the throughout the risk assessment if those with those mitigations in place we achieve an acceptable level uh, of risk. Uh, what is really important to highlight is uh, one cardinal mitigation principle that we typically apply in flight tests. It is what we call as build up approach. The idea that we should and we must actually start from what we know and what is safe and progress uh, to increasingly to going through uh, situations that are more demanding in terms of test conditions uh, with appropriate increments, uh, monitoring, of course, the results and obtaining uh, clearance in each, each condition that we are able to progress safely to the next step. Uh, another important uh, thing that I would like to highlight is crew training, qualification of your test crew, and the composition of your test crew is also uh, 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 important and relevant aspects when we are thinking about safety uh, uh, mitigations of your uh, test plan. So these are important considerations to be done as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, as, as this presentation wants to go through uh, and provide some other reference, I try to also I'll place here on the slide some other good reference that can be used when you are trying to assess the risk. And that's the reason why it's also uh, based on a peer review because it brings uh, other and your experience throughout this process, uh, the experience of your teammates. Uh, there are very good guidance uh, 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 available. The FAA order. 40.40.26 uh, 40. is a good one. The MU standard that I mentioned before is another one. Uh, other industry specialists are also a good reference. And we have available, very available database of test hazards assessments. And NASA and the Flight Test Safety Committee are important reference when you are going through this process as well. Uh, in the next slide, I just try to I exemplify the, the, the matrix of risk assessment as presented on the FAA order. So you can see here the, in the left-hand side, you can see the matrix of uh, uh, place of acceptable to an acceptable risk uh, throughout the combination of likelihood and severity and the definition of each one of those uh, uh, elements from the minimal to the catastrophic to from frequent to uh, extremely improbable. So combining and assessing the risk, it is uh, uh, an important aspect from or throughout your 
uh, uh, task planning phase. The uh, other important and relevant aspect, especially and probably connected to the FTI definition, it is the data gathering uh, 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 aspect. So uh, data requirements are directly dictated by, again, the, the program and the task scope, and maybe the reporting requirements or the, the, the demonstration of requirements uh, uh, that needs to be done. So after all, we know that the entire purpose of the flight pass in the end is to provide data to uh, develop and certify the, the vehicle itself. So the definition of data requirements pass through multiple steps. Uh, and we will see from the process that I mentioned before, specifying the, the parameters and the characteristics of the sensors, uh, also defining of the test conditions and the test that will be performed, uh, and also understanding how the data will be used later in terms of data reduction and analysis maps that will be applied, uh, or maybe how the data will be uh, presented as well in terms of formatting of the data. Uh, but when we look at in flight tests, what constitutes test data, we may divide like in two broader ranges. Uh, one quantitative and qualitative data. When we are talking about quantitative data, it's most of, uh, and again, as a generalization, it, we are talking about prevailing uh, uh, environmental conditions plus uh, parameters that characterize the system or aircraft performance. And these can be, again, recorded manually throughout test cards or uh, recorded throughout your uh, data acquisition system. But we should also uh, uh, remember that uh, qualitative data and test performance, it is uh, an important data uh, and requires a methodical approach to testing, a clear definition of the task uh, with a significant sample and a relevant sample of opinions, uh, usually and most of the times associated to use of rating scales, one and probably the most famous one I'm also placing here in this slide, you can see the Kupferhaka rating scale, uh, that would allow you to, when properly executed, provide a means to turn a subjective opinion into a useful engineering data. Uh, and when we see that the uh, uh, abusive use of uh, uh, a subjective or without uh, uh, constrain the use of the subject data will always yield to uh, misleading results, which should be uh, uh, avoided as much as possible. The next aspect that I would like to highlight, and I mentioned before, is the use of test cards. So we mentioned before that one way to record your data is uh, uh, using a test card for this, for, for the test execution. Uh, we need to prepare appropriate test cards that will detail test objectives, will detail constraints, limitations, uh, vehicle configuration. So, and the test cards should also be a way or a simplified way to denote uh, specific per crew tasks and activities, areas of concern where uh, potential hazards and uh, uh, particular aspects that should be highlighted throughout the test point, plus uh, some uh, room to collect and record, to take notes uh, when performing the, the, the test. I asked the permission for one of my students to take one of his test cards. You can see the handwriting is quite bad, but you can see here, and you can see that the format really depends on uh, how you're going to use your test card and also the situation or personal preference. But you can see that overall those elements that I mentioned before in terms of like the test details, uh, setup and test conditions and configuration limits, risks and place to take notes, they are all there on the slides that we can, as we can see. The last aspect for the entire process that I would like to highlight is actually the flight test report. So in the flight test report, although the format and again, the content varies considerably depending again on the proposed, depending on the authority, depending on the requirements. Uh, what we're gonna see is the technical 
report it is the document that will be the official recording of uh, uh, that or the legal uh, recording and to show compliance against certification requirements and to demonstrate that you met the test objectives and you uh, and in order to also highlight the conclusions and support any decision making that will be done using your 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 document. Uh, because of this importance, because it's a legal document, because it's a, it's a document to show compliance, the document requires to be clear, concise, logically organized, uh, and include all the information that will uh, allow the reader or the authority to understand why was done, what was done, how was done, when was done, and what happened and what was the final result. So in a very balanced and complete uh, way, you try to approach, and again, without talking so much about templates, what we uh, overall see is the document will be separating introduction, results and discussions, conclusions, plus all the supporting annexes that or uh, uh, supplements that will provide additional information to the reader. Uh, when we look at the, the, the flight tests, and typically, and the test pilot schools are famous by the use of a specific test technique, or actually a, a writing technique, which is called seven parts paragraph. Uh, the idea behind when you were writing, when you were uh, uh, presenting the information to the reader, is to try to mirror the flow uh, of the, the, the human communication, like setting the scene or establishing your test conditions, uh, presenting the information, presenting the data in the most clear way, uh, and then following a flow of analysis, role relation, conclusion, recommendation, and specification, you try to make your point. So, uh, the result is it's a, it's a logically built argument that will be more likely to achieve the desired effect once you follow that idea. And this is what the test pilot schools uh, teach. What is really important to see, especially when we look at the seven parts paragraph, you see that it's, uh, it's heavily based on the role relation and recommendation with, with just because it is, there is a, a military uh, uh, school background as well. So what we would see and what the way that we approach here at ITPS as well is not all the time, all parts of paragraph will be relevant to the proposal of your report. Sometimes you wish to uh, present standalone data. Sometimes you'd like to reinforce and support a specification compliance. So uh, the idea of the flow is still valid. We still have to touch the basics and, and follow this idea to uh, uh, logically build your argument but again you can play with the the the, the parts paragraph only using the relevant ones to try to meet uh, and to achieve the desired effect at the end of your report so with that actually i tried to finish or i at least went through the overall process and documentation of flight tests and i'll try to uh, put this into a context now, talking about the certification flight test. Uh, do we have any other question? Yes, we have a question from uh, Jaime Silva. Any anecdotal info on how long it actually took to complete a flight test versus initial estimates? In my experience for complex aircraft, it could be two to three times as many flights and twice as long. Uh, I don't know if I correctly understood to the question, uh, the the idea was uh, if I try to compare against pre prediction, how how much time it would take the flight test campaign, something like this, uh, because it, it is really dependent on what you are trying to demonstrate, right? And then the how complex is the system, so it's 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 hard to try to to give a a, a rule of thumb and saying that's two or three times that that's it. I would say that would take uh, how, depending on how complex your system and depending on what you, what you are trying to demonstrate, it, it can it can take like a, a very long test campaign or can may take some 
only a few flights. It's it's really hard to understand. But if the person would like to like detail a little bit more the, the question, I would be happy to answer. Another question is, in what way should flight testing of EV tall aircraft be different, presumably compared to crude, you know, uh, normal aircraft? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And I think uh, when we, in, in every single meeting of or, or, or the EV tall flight test council, we, we are trying to, to, to maybe answer that. Um, the way that I honestly, and this is my, my way to see uh, especially the EVTOL industry, uh, is we we should try to use as much as we can the lessons learned from the past. And when we are talking about traditional test techniques that can be applied, when we talk about all the lessons learned from the Part 25 fly-by-wire development uh, and envelope protections uh, lessons learned. Um, so as much as we can, we can as much as we 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 are able to we we, we should try to approach the the flight test in a EVTOL vehicle uh using the traditional methods we know that the 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 system is is highly complex so we are going to new concepts as i as i show in the, the the first slide uh some autonomy aspects that we need to consider some different uh 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 Propulsion system and configuration, hybrid configuration, electric uh, vehicles or uh, hybrid uh, 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 systems. So all of this, of course, brings uh, or tries to add new concepts. But again, and, and this is one of the important aspects, especially for focus on this presentation, is we should not see that this will modify the philosophy behind in terms of the process to be applied. And this is an important aspect. We are still heavily be, uh, uh, dependent on, on, on a, on a, on a well-defined plan on uh, uh, covering and assessing properly the risks. Uh, we are also heavily uh, based on the, 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 the definition of what we need to collect, uh, how it will be collected. Uh, the, the principle of test conducting will not change so much, although, again, we are seeing that most of the companies are using remotely uh, pilot aircraft would change the environment, change the 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 how how the the, the test conducting occurs. I see that there are several uh, uh, things that are new in the industry, but I see that as well that the 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 traditional or at least the lessons learned from the the the, the conventional uh, test methods and test techniques that are still applicable. And this is the way that I see at least that the industry must evolve uh, to find its own way to perform its, uh, uh, flight tests. Thank you, Joe. Um, we have a question from Matthew Hasbone. How is simulation currently being used to support flight testing? How might simulation better support flight testing and certification in the future? Okay, I will not answer that question. Actually, when we go through certification flight tests, I will actually uh, touch uh, a simulation and I hope that I will be able to answer those questions, okay? I, I, will, I will hold for now. We have another question from Lucille Busman. What are the differences of the hazard analysis process compared to the ARP 4754 proposed processes such as FHA and PASA, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, it, it, is, it, it is a good question because when we look at the, the, in terms of system development perspective, you can see that the other techniques, all the techniques to assess uh, 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 risk are available, especially for highly complex software development and, 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 and so on. What I try to highlight on the uh, uh, risk assessment and fl flight test risk assessment, uh, I try to highlight that the, the, the classical methodology, it's a, a simple, uh, it's not simple, but it's a, it's a, a, a list of uh, applicable hazards and the a subjective assessment of likelihood and uh, the, the, the effect of that hazard. So different from most of the, the quantitative methods of uh, hazard and risk assessment, you are going to see that the, the method that I try to highlight there 
the the test hardness assessment or, or THAs uh, for the the safety review board and in, in, in flight test plans, they are actually high level uh, aspects that will be mostly trying to focus on the um, uh, procedures or layers of uh, 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 protections that you can create in order to mitigate that that hazard. So this is the the way that I see the difference between them. But again, uh, if we look at the the ARP or if we look at the uh, other methods that I mentioned before, uh, STPA, STEM, they will also be able to support maybe with more, even more uh, quantitative data, the, the the way that you decide to approach in terms of the, the, the tests that you plan and the mitigations uh, that you uh, try to reinforce throughout your test campaign. Uh, so an, another part of that question from Lucille, um, is, is such, isn't such analysis considered, considered to have been conducted during the design process? It, 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 indeed, you, you will use as much as you can throughout the, your, your test planning, the, 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 the out or the input from all the departments that develop the systems and the, 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 define the architecture to use and see how many of those houses that were raised throughout the development of those systems will be still applicable for your test campaign. So, and, and this is another aspect that I would like to raise is, uh, although all those hazards probably they were documented and they were previously previously assessed on the development, we're gonna see that your your the risk uh, level that you will be exposure in the flight test campaign it is associated to what you are trying to uh, test. So the test scope is what drives uh, what are the hazards that will be applicable to your flight test campaign. So although again your system your safety uh, uh, management system will address those all those hazards that all the departments were already uh, 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 studying beforehand on the development phase. You're gonna see your test plan. We'll try to collate. We'll try to combine the ones that you see that will be somehow uh, ha highly exposed when you were performing your test campaign. So again, those are source of information that. And uh, maybe I, I forgot to also list when I when I listed the, the all the other uh, source that can be used. It is all the the development uh, uh, hazard and risk assessments throughout all the different techniques that were uh, used uh, during the development. They are good reference to uh, 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 at least exemplify or, or give some reference to the test crew when uh, defining the, the, the test plan. Thank you, Joe. I don't see any other questions at this time, so feel free to go ahead. All right, so again, my idea is now to put this process and, and those concepts into a context of a certification flight test, okay? So uh, again, I, I opened the presentation talking about this, but before we go further, what is really important to highlight is first, I'm not talking about, uh, or I'm not talking as or under the the, the 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 point of view of any of the the certification authorities, mostly famous EASA and FAA, and this presentation will broadly generalize uh, the certification process and kind of discuss only the main elements that will be required to be understood by flight test personnel. Okay, again, the 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 certification process. It is a complex subject, subject. so we are going to see that uh, if you want to go further, if you want to go in depth, there is an extensive written material available. Uh, and although some, some of them may be kind of hard to understand or difficult to fully understand for a known uh, certification specialist, or maybe for someone with uh, not much background in the certification area, I try to list here uh some um important reference uh, for uh, uh understanding the, the the process so you can see here from the asset the part 21 it's it's the in the amc associated and all the guidance material associated uh from the faa you can see also the uh, uh part 21 plus the the order 8110 for c uh, the 
type certificate training book, or it, it, it's, available, it's also available information, the FAA and industry guide to product certification. So all those uh, 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 reference are a starting point for anyone that would like to in depth understand the certification process. And again, I'll try to simply touch uh, into important concepts for flight testers, okay? Uh, before actually we, 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 we go through the process of a certification and we understand where the certification flight test will be within that process, I would like to, again, as, as I did from the previous slides, I would like to first define what is uh, or what does uh, type certification mean? Uh, if we look at again at the part 21, the FAA part 21, I went through the FAA part 21 and the paragraph 2141 will describe that a type certificate includes the type design, operating limitations, the certificate data sheet, the applicable uh, regulations, uh, and uh, any other uh, conditions or limitations that are prescribed for the product on this subchapter, the, the part 21. So actually, when we look at what is type, we see that type is something unique. It's uh, like, uh, uh, it's a set with its own requirements, design, limitations, production uh, characters. And actually the type certificate, it is the document, it is the element that confirms that that's something, that type complies with this type. So everything, all those and all the, uh, 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 so throughout the process, what we're gonna try to demonstrate is compliance. So we, which mean that we're gonna verify if the type design has actually met all the certification uh, technical requirements, plus if throughout the process that was not shown any unsafe aspect or characteristics when in operation. Then we're gonna see that conformity, it is associated to us individual product. So it's a way to try to demonstrate that now a product, it is built in accordance to a type design. So which in the type design has a type certificate. So if we think about the certificate of awareness, it is an essentially a production quality assurance uh, document that was issued that includes inspections, tests, and production flight tests uh, to demonstrate conformity with the type. Okay, so we go from a set of uh, design characteristics plus requirements to uh, something that was was built according to that type design. Okay, and in order to show compliance, in order to uh, uh, achieve uh, the, the the state in which the type certificate will be issued, we want to go through a process, right? So, and again, the process can have different names, can be separated in different number of phase. Uh, but again, I try to generalize here uh, into mainly five phase where the five four represents where the, the overall process terminates with the issues of the, the type certificate plus with a demonstration uh, and uh, the, the stating that all the compliance record was completed and all the other documentations associated like uh, certificate data sheet, manuals uh, uh, were all done, plus the, uh, which opens also the, the phase five, which is the post uh, certification activity where some, maybe some optional or additional aircraft operation capabilities were demonstrated, or maybe some uh, parallel or uh, uh, bilateral agreement with other authorities will be started as well. But what I would like to highlight in this presentation is the first three phase, which may, uh, may be uh, the, where the, the flight testing uh, will be heavily involved as well. So this is the, the aspects that I would like to uh, highlight in the following slides. So it's the phase one where we're gonna have the application and certification base, the phase two, where we can establish the means of compliance, and the phase three, which we will, I'm calling here as the phase where we're gonna demonstrate and record compliance, okay? So going through the phase one, what we're gonna find out is the phase one, it, it, although we think that, uh, and, and we, 
we know that the development cycle starts much before what I'm calling here as phase one with all the development, all the marketing and all the, the, the study of the, uh, that was necessary to start to build and develop your aircraft. The phase one actually starts and formally starts with the formal application, the, the certification authority. So, and this triggers actually a series of familiarization meetings uh, where uh, management and technical meetings will be discussed regarding uh, or will be discussing overall design, new or innovative uh, features that will be implemented, technical risk areas, uh, overall certification approach in terms of the scheduling, in terms of uh, 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 um, overall uh, or expected certification base, expected means of compliance. So everything that will, will be triggered to through the, the, the form. And also, uh, it will also start a phase where you're gonna start to understand how technically capable you as applicant is to perform those those tests. So there is, a, 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 or there are specific requirements, especially for uh, uh, applicants conducting flight tests, uh, especially in terms of how they approach risk and their safe managing systems as well. And good reference for that is if you go to the flight test uh, operating manual uh, template from EASA or the part 21, you're gonna see good reference of how your flight testing should be established if you want to conduct flight tests for certification purposes. But if I want to highlight the most important milestone or the most important element from what I'm calling here as a phase one, the first phase of certification, it is the definition of certification base. The definition of certification base, it is the, uh, 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 the agreement between applicant and authority regarding all the technical requirements that will be demonstrated, including requirements related to emissions and noise, plus requirements uh, or special conditions, uh, findings of equivalent level of safety, exemptions, and uh, uh, if I'm, I'm talking about milestone, uh, those uh, discussions in that agreement will be actually uh, 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 recorded based on what we call as a general issue paper. The general issue paper one, it is the certification basis issue paper. When we go to phase two, we are now trying to find an agreement between applicant and authority uh, a, regarding or using as reference the certification base and then going paragraph by paragraph or element by element of the certification uh, base and uh, uh, discussing and agreeing uh, regarding how each one of those paragraphs will be uh, demonstrated. Uh, so what we, what we call as a means of compliance, how, and typically a numerical system is conventionally adopted, which I'm also uh, uh, placing here on the slide, and you can see it goes from the mean of compliance zero, and uh, especially if we are thinking about the mean of compliance where flight tests will be uh, involved, you can see the mean of compliance uh, five, six, uh, ground tests and flight tests, and nowadays, the mean of compliance eight as well, simulation and uh, modeling. Uh, plus, another thing that comes throughout the, the phase two is the definition uh, with the creation of your certification plans, not only the definition of how you plan to demonstrate, but also the level of the, the, the agreement in terms of the level of involvement of the uh, certification authority. Uh, typically, and how much the certification authority will be involved, it is based on the risk uh, criteria. So even if there is a, 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 a level of delega delegation, the authority will and 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 will consider uh, the project will consider uh, available resource from the the uh, authority uh, level as well. Uh, technical maturity from the company as well. And many other factors are considered, especially when we are looking at the involvement of the authority. Uh, and the definition of the surveillance uh, um, uh, tasks that will be performed 
and overseen by the uh, authority, especially when there is a, a specific level of delegation. So uh, in this phase, we are going to see that the not only the means of compliance will be uh, 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 agreed in maybe by by discipline, maybe by uh, certification plans. It really depends on how uh, you 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 define your your certification approach. Uh, the 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 associated compliance documents that will be generated throughout those tests and and uh, to demonstrate and show compliance uh, will be also defined. Plus all the differences in terms of opinions, in terms of uh, 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 demonstration, it will be also documented in what we call the issue papers, uh, where the authority expects certain means of compliance, uh, certification memoranda, uh, certification review items. So all those documents will be also uh, uh, usually built and discussed throughout this phase. But if we think about actually the probably the centerpiece, especially for us hands-on testers, the centerpiece of the process is what I call as the phase three. And, and, and what is really important, you see that uh, there may be overlap, between, especially in phase two and phase three, because once the uh, a certification plan is approved, it is an approval to start conducting your test uh, 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 campaign. Uh, however, you may have other disciplines still discussing certification plans. So there is an overlap between those phases, but this, this centerpiece where you are demonstrating and recording compliance is based on what you agreed that will be uh, uh, you, the way that you are demonstrate. You as applicant will actually conduct your tests and will demonstrate throughout the documentation that you will uh, be supporting your test results that the uh, certification requirements were met. So you, as an applicant, will show compliance uh, uh, using your, your, your document support. Uh, the authority will be responsible to complete its surveillance activities uh, and finding compliance, which uh, those activities can include witnessing of tests and or conducting uh, their their own tests. So authorities will typically sample uh, selected uh, uh, test points already conducted by by you as applicant to find compliance. Sometimes performance test points, handling and flying quality test points, system uh, operation and system performance, uh, especially uh, test points regarding human factors, flight crew procedures, uh, and assessment of continued. Uh, safe flight and landing, uh, falling a failure. So some of the uh, test points uh, uh, will be sampled by the authority in order to complete its uh, surveillance activities. Uh, this phase is also uh, comprised by the uh, emission of uh, other documents that will be supporting the, the demonstration of the type, like manuals, uh, MML, uh, so all those documentation will be also created and uh, issued throughout the phase three. So now you may ask is when and where the flight tests will be involved in throughout this uh, 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 entire phase. Uh, the first thing and probably the easier answer is uh, every time that you see in your test plan a mean of compliance six or flight test, is it is a moment where uh, the flight test team, the flight test crew, and the whole team that supports the flight test activity will be uh, uh, involved in order to show compliance against. And what we will see is typically against the subpart B of the part, if we look at 23 to 29. Uh, if we look at when, we are going to see that the test, once the certification plan is approved, the test will start when that particular aspect under the scope of the test is already frozen and established. So a good example is like if I'm doing a uh, stall test, I need to have an airframe and an aerodynamic configuration frozen, plus maybe the stall protection system already uh, frozen as well in order to uh, be able to conduct my, my stalling test. And, but maybe the uh, TCAS is not in the, the final version of software. So again, 
once you have the, the scope, the aspects or the particular aspect under the scope of the test frozen uh, and well established, you were able in the test and certification plans approved, you were able to conduct your test. Uh, and of course, if there are any other system that may be not in full conformity with the end state of your product, you may, and or if there is any doubt, of course, you may come back to regression tests and uh, uh, and do some further limit testing in order to demonstrate that there is no change or no effect uh, once the test configuration was changed or that characteristic was changed. Uh, another important thing is, uh, although it's it is kind of naive to think that only subpart B requirements, uh, especially when we're talking about the conventional part 23, 25, 27, and 29, require involvement of flight tests. Uh, because what we're going to see is flight test interface with several other disciplines. Uh, uh, and good examples is structural uh, uh, um, um, requirements may be associated to a flight test menu of compliance, uh, flight controls, other systems, uh, software, noise. So there are several other uh, disciplines and, and, and elements in other subparts of uh, 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 a certification part that would require some involvement in flight tests. And not only that, uh, not only means of compliance six or the mean of compliance of flight tests would require some involvement of flight test team. We see that the mean of compliance five uh, round tests may be uh, requiring some kind of flight test. And actually, uh, 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 in reality, what we are going to find out is the, the flight test, it is involved throughout the entire certification process. Uh, first, because typically we're going to see that test crew will uh, interface with the authority counterpart, plus every time that any kind of uh, uh, subjective assessment or uh, a pilot judgment is requirement, you're going to see that there will be there will be an involvement from flight test. So, and I try to list few situations where this will be necessary. So, if we are talking about level of pilot skill, uh, crew workload, it is uh, 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 based on, on, on flight test uh, subjective assessment, uh, consistent and ease of operation, uh, crew procedures, emergency procedures, continuous safe of flight and landing. HMI, so human machine interface, interpretation of displays, indications, uh, ergonomics. So any time that or any other aspect that requires some kind of pilot judgment, we are going to see that flight tests will um, uh, be involved. The other aspect that nowadays we are going to see that flight test is involved in is especially in terms of simulation. So simulation is now and uh, commonly uh, used uh, uh, or try to be used as a, a mean of compliance, as a demonstration of compliance, and is heavily involved in flight tests. Uh, I tried to, before talking about certification or uh, 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 using um, simulation, I try to just to justify the reason why simulation is becoming so much uh, well integrated in the whole uh, aircraft development. So first, we're going to see that the, uh, simulation, uh, especially the level of simulation that we see nowadays, we see that reduce the amount of uh, aircraft systems development testing requiring uh, uh, that it was that's required and eliminate most of or try to mitigate any late change design or uh, uh, changes that are done throughout ground test and flight test program. So usually uh, uh, late discoveries during testing uh, have high impact on the test schedule and uh, 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 usually leads to delays on the flight test program. So typically uh, a way to try to mitigate that is achieving a specific level of maturity using simulation and integration uh, test rigs. So this is a, a, a good reason to use simulation. So uh, in order to reduce the duration of flight test program uh, by improving the test maturity, especially before the first flight, uh, and uh, 
to minimize as well aircraft, the, the flight test vehicles utilization for demonstrating compliance and for uh, 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 certification uh, proposals, we're gonna see that the, 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 the use of simulation is uh, it's increasing and increasing. Uh, of course, there is also an idea to try to mitigate uh, technical and uh, safety uh, 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 hazards and risks. So uh, typically, you'd like to focus on hazards tests and failure case uh, that cannot be easily or conveniently be performed in a test aircraft to use simulation, or maybe because just the, the cost is prohibitive and you'd like to uh, 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 perform those tests uh, using simulation. Uh, of course, for those, uh, what is required is to have a suitable and representative simulator, simulator, which is probably one of the most uh, relevant aspects to be discussed. When we look at actually the the the, the use of simulation in uh, aircraft development and certification, the first uh, thing that is important to highlight is if you'd like or if you already uh, uh, heavily invested in simulation and system and test rigs, uh, your process and your quality and conformity process must be as good as uh, the process that uh, it's currently applied in your test vehicles, in your real aircraft. Uh, so here I'm showing a, a, a quite common uh, process among some aircraft development. Uh, which is a, 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 a synonymous of continuous quality improvement. So we can see that uh, throughout a series of update loops, we are transforming the simulator device in, a, in a element as representative as possible of the real aircraft. So over time, you can see that the simulator uh, and test rig and the aircraft will attain a high level of commonality uh, and fidelity. Uh, and of course, this is based on discrete steps of test conducting to recalibrate models uh, and conduct and review your V and V uh, uh, diagram at every single stage of your test. Uh, although it's, uh, it's uh, difficult to obtain sometimes certification credit using uh, test rigs and engineering device, uh, the, as I mentioned before, the only way to be, or the, the, the starting point to be able to obtain uh, uh, those certification credits, it is to be able to demonstrate uh, the test configuration and conformity are fully documented, they are audible, and they, you have a rigorous process to uh, make sure that the, the system uh, behaves as close as possible to the real aircraft. I will not talk much about the, the, the validation of models or demonstration of models. Uh, this week we have on the European aircraft uh, for some, uh, uh, actually the, the, the Polytechnic de Milano will have a very nice presentation to actually use simulation and certification process. It will be a nice presentation. I will invite everyone to attend, uh, but it's, what I'd like to reinforce is really the aspects associated to the process that needs to be established in order to make sure that uh, the, the, the system uh, or you demonstrate conformity with the test vehicle when you are trying to gain certification credits. Regardless of the certification credits or the capability of your scene, you're going to see that the simulation is still an invaluable tool throughout the, the certification campaign uh, and it will be used to uh, verify modifications, uh, updates of control laws, software to gain maturity, as I mentioned before. Uh, it is also a high available uh, tool for planning, uh, especially for critical and high risk uh, trials. Uh, as long as you have this uh, representative design, you can see that the, you can uh, 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 rehearse uh, failure, you can rehearse your test team, you can rehearse your telemetry personnel. Uh, uh, and this will put everyone uh, up to speed to perform those uh, high risk trials. Uh, additionally, you're going to see that nowadays uh, the, the cross check of the test results are also being done. Uh, when you take your test results and findings, 
and back to the simulator to try to not only compare uh, how predictable your derivatives and the, the system behavior was, but also as a useful and powerful process to reestablish or reanalyze your, your test results. So these are reasons, again, Regardless of the certification credit, these are still reasons why you should try to uh, you should you should try to uh, use as the simulation as much as you can throughout the entire certification campaign. So actually, this kind of ends my uh, presentation. So I have only final remarks. I don't know if you have any other question. Uh, then uh, that like yes. to pose. I yes, can go for the final remarks if you wish, and then we we open for questions. Yeah, so we have a few questions here. Okay. Um, and then, f folks, feel free to raise your hand as well if you have other questions. Um, does EASA have representatives in the U.S. to witness tests in the U.S., or are they willing to travel to witness tests or send an FAA designee? Yeah. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I will not. I will not answer that question just because probably I, I, I don't know the answer. And then again, I, I don't want to speak as an as a personal because I'm not. So I, I, I prefer to, uh, maybe we have someone in the audience that will be able to, uh, again, the, the validation and the, the, the bilateral agreements between the authorities, they uh, uh, work in a slightly different way. Uh, but, but, but again, if there is a, a parallel process, it is, a, 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 a way to try to 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 gain time throughout your your certification process to have both or any other authority following and witnessing tests at the same time at the, the main authority in which you you applied for certification. But it, but, well, but I'll, I'll, add, the, I'll add into that uh, that yeah, yeah please the idea of bilateral uh, certification is. The FAA, in this case, if you're, if you're certifying the United States, the FAA is supposed to coordinate with EAS or Transport Canada or whoever the other authorities are so that the applicants don't have to repeat so much work. That's what they're supposed to do, pre-coordinate. Now, there, there might be some stuff that, the, the, you know, for instance, the Canadians will come down and say, well, we like how you do everything in the FAA except we have special requirements for cold weather testing. And we're exactly. going to come down and look just at that because we have special requirements. So, but that is up to the FAA to coordinate that if you're doing it in the U.S. So, there's your answer. And, 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 and then just uh, reinforce some of the aspects that I'll mention as well. Is uh, usually in those bilateral agreements, uh, we, we should also remember that especially issue papers, uh, findings of equivalent level of safety high special conditions, they are kind of, and sometimes subjective in the way that the, there is an interpretation for the authority as well. So different authorities may have different interpretations and that's what leads you sometimes to uh, have uh, uh, additional tests to be, or additional demonstrations to be performed. But again, the bilateral agreement should try to avoid as much as uh, possible this uh, uh, extension of uh, a certification campaign just because we need to demonstrate more because there is no agreement okay another question we have is is the poh approved after obtaining type certificate or should it be while demonstrating compliance phase three yeah th this is a this is a good question so we saw and based on what i presented is that uh, the the manual in your flight manual it is part, it is a, it's defined as your type, okay? So one important document that defines type, where, for example, the limitations are written, the operational limitations are written, it is your manual. So the manual, it is a document that will be issued on the phase uh, uh, three, and before your type certificate, it must be approved. Thank you. Another question we have is it uh, can you introduce the concept of level of interest from the certification authorities? Uh, level of interest in the sense of I understand the question in the sense of what will be the level of involvement of the authority throughout the process. So we can have, especially in the, uh, there are a few certification authorities that are dealing with uh, 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 types of delegations, right? We can have an organization that uh, that defining compliance is delegated. We can have 
uh, uh, individuals that have the, the finding compliance delegated. Uh, so this is the kind of level and the uh, involvement that we're going to see uh, from the authority. So can I have, for example, a document that will be reviewed and the finding compliance uh, done by an specialist from the certification authority. We can have maybe maybe someone from your team that works at a, as a delegate and uh, will be actually finding compliance throughout your process and the certification authority just audit this process. Or we can have the situation, especially in Europe, we have organizations that are delegated to find compliance. And so again, depending on how critical is the certification process, depending on how is the maturity level of the company, depending on how critical is the system, we're gonna see that those levels can be uh, increasing and increasing in terms of how much involvement you're gonna see from the authority uh, and how much you can gain time with that as well. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we have a few requests for the presentation slides. Um, if you're able to attach them in the handouts, that would be great. Yes. Otherwise, I'm sure we'll, able, we'll also provide them on the Hover community for FTC members. Yeah, yes, yeah. The, the slides are already posted for the council members in our usual library. And, uh, and if there's any other way that you want to push those out, that's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to you as well. They are pretty open and please. Okay, I think that's all the questions at the moment. Okay. So feel free to proceed. Yeah, so actually now is just my final remarks before we go, before all kill me. Uh, so the the presentation was quite quick. And again, I tried to touch base and few um, aspects on the, 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 the basics of flight tests. So what I tried to, 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 to demonstrate or at least uh, what I, I did my best to try to uh, discuss it is that flight tests requires understanding of basic process and fundamental principles, uh, not only of flight tests, flight mechanics and so on. So it requires continuous training. And this is one point that I like to reinforce. Requires discipline, careful planning, risk mitigations, uh, requires impartial reporting and overall teamwork. Okay. The other thing that I tried to do during the presentation uh, was to give an overall idea of the certification activities, especially the ones that we're gonna have flight tests uh, personal involved. What we saw is it is a long process. Uh, Mark, uh, SFT uh, present, recently published also uh, and posted on, on, on LinkedIn and, and, and Facebook a uh, few nice posts about uh, the flight test process and uh, timelines and everything. They, they are very good reference as well. Uh, and it is a challenging process. So especially when we have subjective uh, 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 evaluations where we're going to see the, the, uh, the, the flight test involved, uh, we should remember uh, human factors are actually a significant component of a modern airplane certification uh, effort. So you're gonna see the flight test when you be involved, and so you're gonna you're gonna see that challenge will be on also involved. But I'd like to thank you so much for the opportunity to talk. And uh, again, if you have any other question, I will leave also my uh, 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 contact as well. If you wanna send me a message, uh, just feel free. I will be happy to and glad to help. Uh, we do and, have uh, a hand raised from Mark. Would you take one more question? Of course. Unless uh, all would like to kill me in now. I will do one more. <laughs> Mark, go ahead. Hey, thanks. I thought it might take a second to try to clarify the multi-nation certification question. And if we've got anybody from a, a regulatory agency on, feel free to correct me. But my understanding is for initial certification, one nation takes that. So let's make it easy and let's say it's the FAA. And then with the bilateral under the umbrella of a bilateral, other nation regulatory agencies can validate that initial cert. And in that bilateral, they might have agreements for some things to be automatic, but typically they're going to probably come in and do some level of flight test, a smaller scope, a smaller subset. So unless the applicant tries to do a concurrent multi-nation initial cert it's sort of a serial process not a parallel process i just want to make sure that was clear to everybody 
Nicely said. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Okay. Uh, so, Joel, thank you so much. Uh, this was this was great. This exactly served the purpose. We had uh, over 200 people log in. That tells us that there was quite a few people that needed to get this initial sense of what's required for certification. And as you'll notice, this is a largely generic. This can apply to any kind of aircraft, not just eVTOL. Uh, and of course, we touched a little bit on eVTOL tones, and there's tons more information to go. So if any of you are thinking about getting into this business, you can hopefully see this is just the tip of the iceberg. And if you don't have a, an organization that has a lot of depth in this, you probably need to go somewhere for training. And of course, ITPS is, a, is already active in this and there's other test pilot schools as well, of course. So keep that in mind. We're trying to get everybody to step up their, their level of play. So uh, as, we, as we close out, and by the way, I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, for those of you who don't know me and the council, I am Al Lawless. I am the, the chairman of the EVTOL Flight Test Council. And we have regular meetings every two weeks. We talk about specifically electric aircraft and EVTOL types. And anybody is interested to join, you can uh, find me through the website and so forth. And uh, so we're an open organization. We meet bi-weekly and every now and then we do something really special like what we just had today in the webinar. And VFS will post this webinar along with their other webinars in a special part of their website. And so anybody can go see that anytime. And so we help to keep circulating the word for that. So big thanks to VFS for being such a fantastic host. You guys are always rocking it. And, uh, and thank you again, sir. With that, let's call it a day. Adieu.